Today's episode is brought to you by T-Mobile, America's best unlimited network. What's going on, guys? Game of Thrones season seven is nigh. And there are so many characters, so many plot points. I forgot a lot of what happened last season, so that's why we do our public service, The Idiot's Guide to Game of Thrones. And we've got an amazing crew to break down the last season for us. In fact, they are the hosts of Screen Junkies show, Watching Thrones. First, I'd like to introduce, you know her from SJ News and all over the place, Roth Cornette. Hello, I'm excited to get our thrones on. Oh, she uh, was one of the previous hosts of Watching Thrones and she's emerged back. Uh, welcome back, Michelle Boyd. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me again. I'm a raging throner right now. <laughs> He's the head writer of Honest Trailers. You know him, you love him, Spencer Gilbert. I drink and I know things, Hal. So we're gonna break this down piece by piece to make sure that you guys are all caught up and ready for the premiere of season seven. Roth, shall we venture to the north? So the season opens and after torturing us fans, letting us, yes, Jon Snow is dead, Jon Snow is dead. Finally, as predicted, Melisandre brings him back to life at the behest of Ser Davos. You were dead and no, you're not. That's completely Mad. So maybe he's basically bulletproof for the rest of the uh, series. He uses this opportunity to basically get out of his oath. My watch is ended. So yeah, we learned a little bit more about Melisandre. She went from red fox to silver fox. <laughs> uh, or not quite a silver fox. She was, yeah, yeah just a hag. <laughs> like 190 years old. I do think that she will come back because I do think she has a larger role to play and she's still a big believer in Jon Snow. If you return to the north, I'll have you hanged as a murderer. There was a nice uh, brother-sister, bastard-sister reunion. Since the first episode, you're waiting for the Starks to get back together, and who is it? It's Sansa and Jon, who actually didn't have that close of a relationship. But because of everything that they've been through, it's kind of trench mentality, and now they're very close. Except that she's not fully trusting Jon. She has an alliance with Littlefinger uh -huh. that she doesn't tell him about. Meanwhile, Littlefinger is trying to convince her that he and she together should take the Iron Throne. And you by my side. So fan favorite Leanna Mormont comes yes. out of nowhere to steal our hearts and make us want to elect her as president of the world. Mm -hmm. And she's ultimately able to get everyone rallying behind John. He's my king from this day until his last day. And there's sort of like a sideways glance and you're wondering, is Littlefinger gonna be able to convince her to go to the dark side fully? Now, Ramsay has Rickon. Of course, John being John, trying to save Rickon, which he cannot do. <gasps> Jon Snow, in one of the most amazing sequences of the season, you're right in the middle of it, claustrophobic. So it's this amazing battle sequence yeah. and it looks like all is lost. And lo and behold, the Knights of the Vale come to save the day in his big battle against Ramsay. You suggested one-on-one -on -one combat, didn't you? I've reconsidered. And he's going after Ramsay at Winterfell, taking his home back, taking his life back, and he just bleeds him to a bloody frickin' pump. Oh yeah. So Sansa turns his own hounds on him, and you realize she's had one of the best arcs on the show. <laughs> Moving on to Michelle, would you please take us beyond the wall? Poor frickin' Mira has just been dragging Bran around for seasons at this point. Mm -hmm. But we finally learn what Hodor's name means. Hold the door! Hold the door! Freaking Bran. So it's his fault. Basically, <laughs> he was possessing Hodor to hold the door yep. against the undead army in order to let him get away. Ah! Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. Talk to us about the three-eyed raven. He basically tells Bran, The time has come for you to become me. He dies. He lets Bran kind of take over the green seer and gives him this new quest to go back. I'm the three-eyed raven now. Green Seer basically just is kind of a communing with nature sort of thing. Uh -huh. He taps into it with trees. He's able to tap into the history of Westeros. He basically is able to time travel and use the trees as sort of a DeLorean. For lack, I mean, essentially. <laughs> Bran goes back to a very key moment and Bran just learns that Lyanna made Ned promise to protect Jon. Lyanna is actually the mother and Probably Rhaegar Targaryen is the father, and he can influence events in the past. Father! Oh, Michelle, one more thing is that Benjen Stark 
came back in a big way. Cold hands appeared, and for book nerds, we were looking forward to the appearance of this character. And he helped his nephew Bran and Mira to escape, and then of course he was stuck behind the wall, but the question becomes for how long? Does Benjen come beyond the wall with the rest of the White Walkers? I'll do what I can, as long as I can. Spencer, um, let's go to your favorite spot on the map, King's Landing. Oh, it's such a lovely cesspool. <laughs> <laughs> um, to really understand King's Landing this season, you have to know that, as always, it's all about who controls the throne, which at the beginning of season six, held by little bull-cutted kitten-cuddling Tommen Baratheon. <laughs> yep. Uh, and there's three very powerful factions vying for control of him. One is the Tyrells. They have their daughter Marjorie married to Tommen, so she's the queen. Now team two is, uh, as always, Cersei. Um, she's got her claws into her kid. She's lost two out of three children already. She's got a seven-foot-tall zombie bodyguard. <laughs> And then finally, we have this newly empowered branch uh, of the High Sparrow, and uh, religion has started to play a big part in King's Landing. It's what the gods want. Cersei's got a trial date coming up for incest. You've got Marjorie and Loras imprisoned, and this causes the other two former rivals, the Tyrells and the Lannisters, to join together, to put aside their differences, and to take out the High Sparrow. But Tommen comes out and stops the ruckus from really happening. The crown and the faith together we will restore the Seven Kingdoms to glory. Oh no, Cersei's defeated. Or is she? Kaboom, she had wildfire planted under the Great Sept of Baelor, blew it all up, everybody dead. So long. Tommen, sweet little child that he is, was so distraught, he took a long jump off a high tower yes. <laughs> and never to be seen again. Cersei is down three kids, up a glass of wine, and up the Iron Throne, which is what she may have wanted all along. I now proclaim Cersei of the House Lannister, protector of the Seven Kingdoms. Who arrives back in King's Landing at that very moment? Jamie did show up at the end of this season. He kind of went on a detour before that to break the siege of River Run. So he's really going through uh, uh, this kind of identity crisis of what his role is. Is he a knight? Who does he hold his loyalty to? He's still obsessed with Cersei, as he confesses, but then you also have Big Brienne of Tarth uh, holding him to a more chivalrous standard. It's yours. It will always be yours. Talk to us about uh, Kyburn and uh, Franken Mountain. Kyburn, <laughs> so he's an ex maester, uh, gone bad, pumping the mountain, uh, last seen dead in trial by combat, uh, full of evil juice uh, to make him <laughs> into an unstoppable killing machine. Yes. You get to see a lot of that in season six, and it's awesome. Varys had his little birds, but the little birds are still present. Little birds has been interesting. It's a term that Varys used throughout the series. And it's a network of spies made up of little children who will stab you if you cross them. <laughs> so Marjorie Tyrell is gone, but Lady Elena is still around. Well, she ends the season lining up with Dorne. And what is my heart's desire? Fire and blood. Michelle, will you take us to Essos? At the beginning of the season, you see Danny being kidnapped by a Kalasar to get brought to uh, via Stothrak. When Drogo was killed, Danny was supposed to go there and join the Dosh Kaleen, which is just basically the group of widows. So she gets brought over to via Stothrak, and she says, I'm not having any of this, and burns them all. Yerivadrivo. <laughs> Tyrion is there with her. They finally got together. She made him Hand of the Queen. I'd swear you're my sword, but I don't actually own a sword. After kicking out Dario to the curb, saying, yeah, you're cute, you're great in bed, but I'm gonna need to find me a husband. I can't bring a lover to Westeros. Theon and Yara came from Pike. They technically are royalty. However, the Ironborn choose their next king, and Theon and Yara's uncle Euron comes back after killing Theon and Yara's father <laughs> to take the throne oh, by basically yeah. saying, I'm going to let you all rape and murder and pillage as much as you want, elect me king. <laughs> He eventually wants to get over to Danny and make some kind of alliance with her. Theon and Yara get to Danny first and make the alliance with her, giving her all of the ships that they stole from the Ironborn. Won't be enough to save them. Danny is finally going to Westeros. After six freaking seasons, right? she's going to <laughs> Westeros. She has an unsullied army. She has ships from Yara and Theon. She's finally going with three full-blown dragons. <laughs> Arya is also on her way home from Essos. She was the girl with no name. She was the blind little girl with no name who just keeps getting beaten up. 
until she finally has a showdown with the waif, she becomes no one, and Jack and Hikar says, cool, you're one of us, and she says, no nope, peace, I'm going home. I'm Arya Stark, mother Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> the list still does mean something to her, cause in the last episode, she goes after Walder Frey. The last thing you're ever going to see is a Stark smiling down at you as you die. Let's move on to a little speed round. Jorah is, uh, he needs to visit the dermatologist. <laughs> Jorah has the same thing that Stannis' daughter had. He has grayscale. The last thing that happens to Jorah is he does get exiled by Danny again, saying, I command you to heal yourself. Find the cure. Spencer, back around to you. Talk to us about those lovebirds, Sam and Gilly. They're still together, they got a baby, he stole his dad's sword, he's studying at college. And that's the Citadel, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Roth, catch us up on the Hound. The Hound, who's a character that we love, we thought was dead, yes. he comes back. But it's very quickly, he meets up with this guy, Brother Ray, who is Ian McShane, which is amazing. And this rogue group of Brothers Without Banners come in and they kill everyone that the Hound is connected with, taking away his reason to be a better man. So now he's out for blood. He goes and he finds the Brothers Without Banners to get his revenge, but they're already gonna kill the rogues. The Brotherhood Without Banners is now headed to the wall. It's possible that they'll connect with Melisandre on the way. And Beric Dondarrion, who's been a part of the thing since season one, is back, boom! And he's gonna play a big role, and we'll talk about that more on our show. Ooh. Cold winds are rising in the north. We could use you. Wow, you guys have done the yeoman's work. You've taken us on a tour of season six. Now, I wanna talk about Real quick, this new segment you have, you're introducing to Watching Thrones called Raging Throners. First off, what exactly is Raging Throners? It's just the thing that gets us the most excited about that episode, or in this case, the entire season. Would each of you give us your Raging Throner from season six? It was the explosion of the set. So that whole sequence, that opening sequence to the finale was so beautifully done. Uh -huh. So top to bottom, that's it. Oh, my favorite moment, Arya slitting Walder Frey's throat. Whoa, it's yeah. been a culmination of everything since her brother and her mother died, since her father died, since the list started. Finally, she gets to cross the big one off her list. I'll say uh, Jon Snow in the Battle of the Bastards, that one moment where he runs out and wants to take on the entire army oh. solo. Come at me, Boltons, Man. I'm right here. Beautiful, what a great moment. Uh, you know what, those are all great Raging Throners. I can't pick one better than the next. What's your Raging Throner? What's something that we left out? Or what's something that you're looking forward to in season seven of Game of Thrones? Let us know in the comments section below. We wanna know. I wanna thank you guys for coming in and dropping so much knowledge on us. Watching Thrones, when can we watch Watching Thrones? Every Monday, Screen Junkies News, 11 a.m. PST Live. Man, that is gonna be awesome. By the way, everybody, next week, we're traveling down to San Diego. So make sure you check out Screen Junkies and Screen Junkies News on YouTube for all of our Comic-Con coverage, presented by T-Mobile, America's best unlimited network. I wanna thank you for watching Screen Junkies. I'm Hal Rudnick, hit me up on Twitter. Bye-bye. Today's episode is brought to you by T-Mobile, America's best unlimited network. What's going on, guys? Game of Thrones, season seven is nigh. And there are so many characters, so many plot points. I forgot a lot of what happened last season, so that's why we do our public service, The Idiot's Guide to Game of Thrones. And we've got an amazing crew to break down the last season for us. In fact, they are the hosts of Screen Junkies show, Watching Thrones. First, I'd like to introduce, you know her from SJ News and all over the place, Roth Cornette. Hello, I'm excited to get our thrones on. Oh, she uh, was one of the previous hosts of Watching Thrones and she's emerged back. Uh, welcome back, Michelle Boyd. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me again. I have a raging throner right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's bad writer of Honest Trailers. You know him, you love him. Spencer Gilbert. I drink and I know things, Hal. So we're gonna break this down piece by piece to make sure that you guys are all caught up and ready for the premiere of season seven. Roth, shall we venture to the north? So the season opens, and after torturing us fans, letting us, yes, Jon Snow is dead, Jon Snow is dead, finally, as predicted, Melisandre brings him back to life at the behest of Ser Davos. You are dead, and no, you're not. That's completely 
mad. So maybe he's basically bulletproof for the rest of the uh, series. He uses this opportunity to basically get out of his oath. My watch is ended. So yeah, we learned a little bit more about Melisandre. She went from Red Fox to Silver Fox. <laughs> uh, or not quite a Silver Fox. She was, yeah, yeah just a hag. <laughs> like 190 years old. I do think that she will come back because I do think she has a larger role to play and she's still a big believer in Jon Snow. If you return to the North, I'll have you hanged as a murderer. There was a nice uh, brother-sister, bastard-sister reunion. Since the first episode, you're waiting for the Starks to get back together, and who is it? It's Sansa and Jon, who actually didn't have that close of a relationship. But because of everything that they've been through, it's kind of trench mentality, and now they're very close. Except that she's not fully trusting Jon. She has an alliance with Littlefinger uh -huh. that she doesn't tell him about. Meanwhile, Littlefinger is trying to convince her that he and she together should take the Iron Throne. And you by my side. So fan favorite Leanna Mormont comes yes. out of nowhere to steal our hearts and make us want to elect her as president of the world. Mm -hmm. And she's ultimately able to get everyone rallying.